I'm so thrilled to be introducing these three poets, Claudia Rankin, Juan Nguyen, and, uh, who will be reading, and Rigoberto Gonzalez, who has graciously agreed to moderate the discussion afterwards. Um, a couple of days ago, I went to go finally visit the Matisse cutout show at MoMA, and uh, I was powerfully reminded of the work of Claudia and Hua. Uh, you know, with respect to Claudia's work, um, Matisse's compositions often employ both the shape that is cut out of the paper and the paper from which it is cut. So you get a positive impression and a negative void, both having equal power and validity in the finished work. Uh, Claudia's most recent book, Citizen, describes two dynamics that have something in common, I think, with that, which is, you know, one dynamic would be an obliteration of personal identity in which, for example, a racial stereotype is superimposed upon you. Um, and then also, and you know, receiving less attention, a seemingly opposite phenomenon, an obliteration of racial identity. For example, when a speaker uses you as a deracinated audience for a tirade against those other people who are, you know, undeserving, threatening, ill-behaved, uh, pick your racist, stereotypes. Citizen does not merely document these two types of microaggression, but it renders the effect of these microaggressions, whether that effect is dispersive, corrosive, or constitutive, of these two types of invisibility on racial and personal consciousness. And then with respect to Hua's work, in the Matisse show one is struck, you know, immediately by the artist's mastery in bringing together agglomerations of fragments seemingly isolated, seemingly far-flung, with an authority that suggests that some physical force is at work, some physical force that is unnamed and mysterious. The placement of shapes in those compositions has something of the inevitability of gravity without the predictability of gravity a description that could equally apply to Hua's poetics. Um, so in terms of official information, Claudia Rankin is a poet, uh, playwright, and all-over literary superstar. Her works include Citizen and American Lyric, uh, for which she is a finalist for this year's National Book Award. Uh, the winners will be announced on Wednesday. Um, her other books include Don't Let Me Be Lonely, also subtitled An American Lyric. Uh, the End of the Alphabet, and Nothing in Nature is Private. Um, and then, born in the Mekong Delta and raised in the Washington, D.C. area, Thuan Wen studied poetics at New College of California in San Francisco, and with the poet Dale Smith, founded Skanky Possum, which is a long-standing poetry journal and book imprint, which they ran out of Austin, Texas, um, which published authors such as Eileen Miles, Amory Baraka, Tom Clark, and Ann Waldman. Um, she is the author of nine books and chapbooks, including most recently, As Long as Trees Last, and um, which came out in 2012, and Red Juice, a collection of previously um, often hard to find work, uh, 1998 through 2008. And she currently lives in Toronto, where she curates a reading series, reads tarot, and teaches poetics at Ryerson University. Um, Rigoberto Gonzalez uh, will be moderating the discussion afterwards. He was born in Bakersfield, California, and raised in Michoacan. Mexico. Um, he is the author of several poetry collections, including most recently, Unpeopled Eden, a winner of the Lambda Literary Award. Uh, he also published the novel Crossing Lines, which won Forward Magazine's Fiction Book of the Year Award. Uh, he lives in New York City and teaches at the MFA programs of both Queens College and Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, thank you to all, and Claudia will be reading first. Good evening. It's very exciting to be here with these two amazing poets who I admire so much. And um, I, I'm, I'm not used to being in New York City where, where things actually happen. <laughs> it's very exciting for me. Um, I 
should say that Citizen is a book that I came out of interviewing many people, including myself. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to start. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I, I literally said to people, um, tell me a story about or wh that happens to you between I, uh, between you and another person um, where something happens that you don't expect. And I wasn't interested in sort of supremacy, you know, some jerk person who identifies as a racist. I was interested in moments between you and your friends where something gets said, something gets done, and suddenly you feel othered by that moment. And then the next moment has to bring you back, or you have to come back, or they have to, you know, something has to happen. And um, so the stories came like that. And I also asked many of my um, black male friends to to tell me moments when they were approached by police. Um, and it was interesting, I would, I would often invite them to dinner and say, um, can you give me a story where, where you, know, you were in your day and you were pulled over and everybody who had a story and um, and often their partner had never heard the story, so we'd be at dinner, and then they would tell me the story, and 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 everybody everybody was being brought into a moment that had been kept private for some reason. Um, so I, I will start there, and then move back to the other kind. I knew whatever was in front of me was happening, and then the police vehicle came to a screeching halt in front of me like they were setting up a blockade. Everywhere were flashes, a siren sounding, and a stretched out roar. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Then I just knew. And you are not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. I left my client's house knowing I would be pulled over. I knew, I, I just knew. I opened my briefcase on the passenger seat just so they could see. Yes, officer rolled around, rolled around on my tongue, which grew out of a bell that could never ring because its emergency was a tolling. I was meant to swallow in a landscape drawn from an ocean bed. You can't drive yourself sane. So angry you are crying. You can't drive yourself sane. This motion wears a guy out. Our motion is wearing you out. And still, you are not that guy. Then flashes a siren, a stretched out roar. And you're not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. I must have been speeding. No, you weren't speeding. I wasn't speeding. You didn't do anything wrong. Then why are you pulling me over? Why am I pulled over? Put your hands where they can be seen. Put your hands in the air. Put your hands up. Then you are stretched out on the hood, then cuffed. Get on the ground now. Each time it begins in the same way, it doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Flashes, a siren, the stretched out roar. Maybe because home was a hood, the officer could not afford, not that a reason was needed. I was pulled out of my vehicle, a block from my door, 
handcuffed and pushed into the police vehicle's back seat, the officer's knees pressing into my collarbone, the officer's warm breath vacating a face, creased into the smile of its own private joke. Each time it begins in the same way, it doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Go ahead and hit me, motherfucker. Fled my lips and the officer did not need to hit me. The officer did not need anything from me except the look on my face on the drive across town. You can't drive yourself sane. You're not insane. Our motion is wearing you out. You are not the guy. This is what it looks like. You know this is wrong. This is not what it looks like. You need to be quiet. This is wrong. You need to close your mouth now. This is what it looks like. Why are you talking if you haven't done anything wrong? And you're not the guy. And still you fit the description. Because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. In a landscape drawn from an ocean bed, you can't drive yourself sane. So angry. You can't drive yourself sane. The charge the officer decided on was exhibition of speed. I was told after the fingerprinting to stand naked, I stood naked. It was only then I was instructed to dress, to leave, to walk all those miles back home. And still, you're not the guy. And still you fit the description because there's only one guy who's always the guy fitting the description. Um, the, the guy who told me much of that story is a lawyer in Beverly Hills. And um, I asked him, what's exhibition of speed? <laughs> and it's one of, it's apparently a charge that the LA police use as a kind of trumped up charge. And it's, if you, if you take it to court, you can have it struck down. Because it's for um, drag racing. So who's drag racing in the middle of L.A.? But they, you know, so in a, in a kind of odd way, they, when, they, when they decide, oh, you're not the guy, they give you this exhibition of speed so that if you take it to court, you can have it expunged. I have a neighbor. His name is Stan. He appears in the next piece. You and your partner go to see the film, The House We Live In. You ask a friend to pick up your child from school. On your way home, your phone rings. Your neighbor tells you he is standing at the window watching a menacing black guy casing both your homes. The guy is walking back and forth, talking to himself and seems disturbed. You tell your neighbor that your friend whom he has met is babysitting. He says, no, it's not him. He's met your friend, and it's not that nice young man. Anyway, he wants you to know he's called the police. Your partner calls your friend and asks him if there's a guy walking back and forth in front of your home. Your friend says that if anyone were outside, he would see him because he is standing outside. You hear the sirens through the speakerphone. Your friend is speaking to your neighbor when you arrive home. The four police cars are gone. Your neighbor has apologized to your friend and is now apologizing to you. Feeling somewhat responsible for the actions of your neighbor, you clumsily tell your friend that the next time he wants to talk on the phone, he should just go in the backyard. He looks at you a long minute before saying he can speak on the phone wherever he wants. Yes, of course you say. Yes, of course. Not one of my better moments. But I, you know, it's that kind of thing where, where the tendency is to want to avoid the conflict, you know? So I was like, you don't understand. You know, because it's, 
the thing about the police and black men is that anything could go wrong in a second. Um, anyway. You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black tarred street being swallowed by speed. He tells you his dean is making him hire a color of person, a person of color, when there are not so many great writers out there. You think maybe this is an experiment and you're being tested or <laughs> retroactively <laughs> insulted or you could have done something. Or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish the light would turn red or a police siren would go off so you could slam on the brake, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly, both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now, as the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. I'm going to close um, with this piece. Every morning I walk my dog, Sammy, um, up the mountain, and then I walk back. <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> um, and I, I, have to, I, I figured out after a few years that instead of making dates with people to go to dinner, or I would just say, oh, meet me at my house at 8 o'clock, and we'll walk up the mountain. So, I walk up the mountain with this random, um, well, not random, but <laughs> it's, it's random in the sense I never know who's going to come, because I, I'm always telling people that, and then people just show up and say, are you walking this morning? And I go, yes, I am. Um, so one morning, um, this woman showed up, and um, as we were walking up, I said, do you, do you have any moments where race, your race, she's a white woman, where race clearly is dictating what you do, your whiteness, your, your, and, and, you know, she told me all of these stories from her students, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, no, I, I don't mean like that, I don't mean like that. And we walked all the way up to the gazebo and then we turned around and we were halfway down the mountain and she said to me, you know, there is one thing I said, well, what is it? And she said, well, whenever I'm on the train and I see a black man sitting by himself, I sit next to him. And I said, well, I do that too. And um, so then we had to discuss whether it had to do with race so much as understanding the political ramifications around the black male body. And also whether or not um, it was for the black male body or for us that we sat there. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No. She would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is the pause in the conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares. You let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, you wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. 
He is gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere. He could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside. You don't speak until you are spoken to, and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat, when, where, why, the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay, I'm okay, you don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit and you sit and look past him into the darkness, the train is moving through a tunnel. All the while the darkness allows you to look at him. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleeve of him. You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing you could feel shadowed. You sit to repair who, whom. You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tile tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally a light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle tracks room, harbor world, a woman asks a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man turns next to you, turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them we are traveling as a family. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Asian American Workshop and you all for coming out on a Friday night in New York City. So I'm going to read from Red Juice, uh, which is, as um, Monica said, it's a and it's an early collected. It's my work before uh, 2008 collected into one volume, and then I'll read some poems from As Long As Trees Last, which came out in 2012 from Wave Books. I have a lot of things marked, but I write small poems, so it won't be, I won't keep you. <laughs> we'll have time to talk. It'll be great. My mom had this um, cookbook uh, she's Vietnamese, right? So she had this cookbook. Um, it was a Betty Crocker cookbook, and it was the three-ring binder style one with, like, a lurid, like, pineapple that was made out of, like, chopped liver on it. You know the one? It was, it was so freaky, and I loved it. I loved to look through it. And then I... But it was freaky in this, a way I couldn't quite figure out. And then... Um, I wrote this poem about baked Alaska from that recipe. Baked Alaska, it is possible. You can take whole parts of land, chunk of ice cream pink, ice cream, mysterious meringue, stuff it in a hot box, hot. How is the trick of it? Baking igloos with kin inside. They are they, not real. Ice cream, white and pink. It's complicated. This is a factually found poem. It's called A Story of History. You shall hear the story. You shall hear the story how 
Palpuk Kiwis danced at Hiawatha's wedding. The student cried, hurrah! The student cried, now you have it. I must have more light. I must have what I asked for. Your presence will not be necessary. That's the story of history. Um, I'm reading this next poem. I, um, I'm, I'm interested in money. Uh, <laughs> right? It's funny because I live in Canada now, but I, I'm from the States. Um, and uh, on Canadian money, the, there's the queen is on the money. Um, and I was like, wow, it's the queen's on the money. That's so weird. And then my friend's like, well, there's slave owners on our money. And I was like, oh. <laughs> anyway, so my, my, my friend uh, likes to talk about the, the, the global, he means global, but he mm -hmm. likes to say gl the global economics. Um, <laughs> you know, where we, we like send all of our industry to, to countries where we can pay them very little. Uh, and we send the raw materials there if we have them and then make them work for a dollar. Uh, anyway, Global is in this poem. And this poem's perfect because it's called, I woke up this morning and it was Friday. I woke up this morning and it was Friday. Scribbling aimlessly and abstractedly on scraps of paper, my life is completely uninteresting to you, dear reader. Oh, I guess I have a mother now. Pretend I am asleep. Hang up. She struggles to carry the flowers up the stairs. If only the world wasn't global. Don't be a sucker. So this is another found poem from a New York Times review of Klemperer's 1942 to 1945 diary. Surrender radio and telephone. Also give up theater, movies, concerts, libraries. Then no more magazines or newspapers. No more Jews on buses. No sitting on trams. Finally no trams except to distant forced labor. No more tobacco, flowers, milk. Turn in the typewriter, also furs, blankets, fabrics. No more biking. Now kill the cat and all other pets. No walking on such and such streets. No storing food at home. No eating at restaurants. No clothing card, no fish card. Just one hour a day for shopping. Turn in all appliances keys, metals, lamps. Uh, I think I was like 11. I delivered newspapers and it was a circular newspaper, like those newspapers where it was just made up of advertising, called the advertiser. <laughs> <laughs> or just advertisers, I can't remember. Anyway, to pass. Wagon, red wagon, rust of course, your overlapping toes on curled edge. I'm back pulling advertisers every Wednesday for to have, for to have fold the newsprint. Sister, I slap you. I am sister older playing trips, yank you down sidewalks, whining in the red wagon. Stop for a sunset. We're suddenly beautiful pretending we are Hawaiians delivering advertisers. I'm going to read this for Monica. Women with sharp noses. Women with sharp noses and underdeveloped third portions of their faces. Skin wings spread wide, scary for their snake hair and fingers loosely clutching daggers, my hands cover my ears. 
The rocky soil holds no visible life. I wear my favorite lace-up knee boots. It's the anxiety of a terrible future where we might have to move our debt to Vancouver or Morocco somewhere with universal health care food straight from growers, no stickers on my apples, otherwise known as how can we live on one state employee pension. They float in a gray cloud, my mother in the dream slurring and taking off her shoes. I can't feel the baby yet. How can you be in love with the baby? I'm also reading this for Monica. <laughs> it's called No Sleep. <laughs> they wrote it when they, I had two children under five. And uh, I was reading a lot about um, environmental collapse. It, I'm, uh, clearly, I'm an anxious person, so I, I'm, I'm interested in economics and economic collapse and the system that we have that's fucked in place and, um, and how we're fucked environmentally. Uh, and one of the things, as we know, if you're an alert person, is <laughs> how <laughs> uh, there are um, not only that there are these trends, but one of the trends uh, in terms of the environmental collapse is um, stronger storms, more extreme weather. And I, at the time, I was living in central Texas, and um, like tornadoes, uh, tornadic storm energy was um, on the increase. But I also read that that certain species are um, benefiting from global climate change, like poison ivy, <laughs> naturally. No sleep. No sleep. No sleep escape. Milk raining down, turning lilies white. Mena presided over moon blood her offerings, young puppies that still sucked their mother. Formaldehyde in the sheets to be wrinkle-free. April 2006, five times the average in tornadoes and thriving poison ivy. The sky turns green. Old Roger has died and gone to his grave, gone to his grave, gone to his grave. Old Roger has died and gone to his grave. Hi ho, gone to his grave. Several ice sheets in Greenland have doubled their rate of slide. My boy blows a plastic whistle, parrot shaped, stamped, made in China. Um, so I was living in central Texas. I've told this story before, so um, bear with me. So grackles are a thing. Uh, grackles are, uh, they're boat-tailed grackles. The, the males are an iridescent black. The females are slightly more olive brown. They, they gather in huge clusters at dusk, uh, and they make a crazy sound if you've ever heard a grackle. It's, uh, it's a, a really intense noise they're supreme scavengers like they'll jump right up on your cafe table and like steal your tofu like off your plate at whole foods and i i, I used to hate them like, passionately and then after um more than a decade in central texas i came to admire how resilient they were and how they were able to adapt to human occupation of space um and then i i kind of realized uh, you know, they, they made a lot of noise, um, they, they shit everywhere, <laughs> they demand a lot of attention, and that they're kind of like poets. And so then I was like, oh, I have to really kind of like them. And so, but here in this poem, I'm wondering how edible they might be. <laughs> there's, also, there's also a plant called a Turk's cap, which um, has these jaunty red flowers that close into a pod that you can eat. And they're in here too. We might be folding. We might be folding laundry. I am fucked, having never learned to start a fire without matches. Now I'm boy scouted. 
I'm cooking eggs. Are grackle eggs edible? Stringy meat from scavengers, surely. We could eat Turks caps pods or insects, roly polies, but there are not enough of them either. And likewise, he realizes my beekeeping dreams are gauzy with no uncomfortable moments like little house on the prairie, the televised one with freckles. Walk from the taco shop with fat styrofoam boxes. I'm almost as old as old Elvis without the pain pills. Should really collect shoes of future sizes for our boys' feet. My oven says clear off. My toilet seats are new and made in China. For lunch, what did I have for lunch? The boys are monitored in front of electronics so I could have poetry and cook. First it was too warm and now very cold with icy threats and the National Guard in Missouri how polar bears are melting in the drowning spaces. There is no room in the shiny, expensive car to take us all to California. I'm just going to read a few of these. Um, so, as Monica mentioned, I grew up in the D.C. area, and that's mentioned in this poem in that I had a dream once, when I was in California, actually, of uh, being back in D.C. in Charles Olson's apartment near Union Station, and Ezra Pound was there, and they both tell me that I could be a poet, which I think is an awesome to transmission and brash of me to say. <laughs> <laughs> My mother worked at a popular um, seafood restaurant called Bish Thompson's in Bethesda, if you knew the place. Um, she was a career waitress, and she's a here. Also, um, Operation Ranch Hand appears, and it um, was an herbicidal defoliant um, campaign in Vietnam between 62 and 72, um, where millions and millions of gallons of defoliant and herbicides were um, sprayed onto the landscape to um, deny the Vietnamese people of food and cover in their... Um, their motto was, only you can prevent a forest. <laughs> so fucked, right? Anyway, so that's why it's called Rage. It's called Rage Sonnet. It's my Rage Sonnet. Rage Sonnet. Rage on the grinding spot. Independence Day. Rag Laundry Day. My boy wears shark pajamas. Mother ran large food trays, sore shoulders, lobster, surf, and turf. It's Independence Day 2011. We may have been poisoned by Operation Ranch Hand. I am not dead yet. Ezra Pound in my DC Charles Olson dream. It is so much harder to be a poet now, they say to me. Lack of rain and the number 30 bus may run now all the way to downtown. You can sample, you can sample cord blood, find rocket fuel there, find rocket fuel in breast milk, also lettuce. I wear a SpongeBob SquarePants Band-Aid. Here the running toilet. Money goes tied to the subprime. We go month to month. Good dog with its ears up. Unless it hunts, it goes. I, I read that in a survival book. Um, if the zombie apocalypse happens, you um, you have to kill your dog, unless it hunts. <laughs> Things are so downer. 
there was a big, still there, there's a, 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 a <clears throat> periods of extreme drought um, in central Texas. Um, when I was living there, I, I think it continues. Um, the lake levels are really down. Uh, the water table levels are really down. So that's all over the work, too. So this is my another drought almost sonnet. Pig farmer says they use most of their water tap to make wallows for the pigs in the yard so they can stay cool. I said I'd pray for rain for them. Why did I say that? There were no free popsicles at Home Depot. Dry, permanent climate change? I would like to see it rain again. China berry is a kind of Asian invasive tree that appears in this collection. And so this is another China berry. Crossing your ankles and no shoes, messy edges, there are no free popsicles! <laughs> you sweep the noisy floor. Make the baby waste her. Big yellow watering can? I'd like to see it rain again. Exercise number three from Colloquial Vietnamese. This is another found poem for Tuan. One. He works and studies at the same time. Two, he can speak French and German. Three, she is both beautiful and nice. Four, I work both for the foreign ministry and for the university. Five, she is happy and sad at the same time. Independence Day, 2010. can be cracked or am that you didn't consider me or I thought so recovering in a nap. You took the 4th of July beers. In the movie, she was Asian and playing an Asian part, singing <laughs> white on white in the white room. I want to strum or mask this day, ask a question of the large picture window like why and why and also why to think of the napalmed girl in the picture last poem because i can't leave you with that <laughs> swell swell you can dream more the earth swells seeds pop i glance at the prize, eyes closed in the glancing. It is not a time to run. I wear soft shoes and it took a long time to walk here. Insects nudge me in my dreams, like the five honeybees plus the strange one, intelligent bee glances buzzing to say, let me out, the fake Lights confuse us, confuses the source. Worker B buzzed my neck directly, me not turning off lamps fast enough. Please, just open the door to the sun. Thank you so much. Testing, testing. 
cayó esta hora? It's on. It's on. Yes, it All is. All right. Yes, wonderful. Well, thank you for those wonderful, wonderful presentations. Um, and uh, thank you, all of you. Good people in the back. Saludos. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some questions to our readers, and then I have an opportunity to engage some of you uh, to ask questions as well. So uh, instead of asking you the dreaded question with a one-word answer, can poetry matter? I thought I'd ask you uh, instead about the social and political function of poetry. I mean, Claudia, I mean, your work, uh, especially Citizen, this year has been so unsettling and also exhilarating in its timeliness, uh, in, its, in the way that it's been uh, allowing us to read what has been, been unfolding before us uh, on the news and before our very you know, own eyes this entire calendar year, it seems like. And Hua, you know, I'm very intrigued by the environmental and ecological concerns uh, of your work. So my question was, what is the role and responsibility of the poet and her art? <laughs> responsibility and, and function? Responsibility. So I'm just yeah, the, so, the social and political this. function of poetry, but also what is the role and responsibility of, the, of poetry and of the poet and her art? Mm -hmm. Help me out here, you guys. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know if I think about that. I don't actually. I mean, I when I was working on Citizen, I didn't think I was writing a, a socially responsible book. I I thought I was writing a book about intimacy and um, the ways in which the space between two people gets polluted by the racial imaginary and um, racial constructs that get in the way of just human beings interacting. Um, I was also responding to scandalous moments in the news, but at the time they were happening, so I wasn't thinking that, you know, forward, I was just thinking in the present moment. Um, the fact that they keep replicating themselves is unfortunate. And I think that's great because that gives me a way to speak. Um, <laughs> to, I think my concerns are the concerns that are often shared with um, humans, right? As, well, as I said, it's been particularly if you're alert to the conditions. Um, and so I, um, and it's difficult not to be. Uh, and so I think I was also responding. Um, to patterns um, uh, that are there. And I think, and I think for me, poetry is responsive to patterns both in its um, very nature, um, in that it's a patterned and particularized way of writing that's different from prose, um, or traditionally you know, rendered prose. And um, I feel that while my concerns do involve sort of, you know, um, issues of class, issues of race, issues of um, you know, that are about being, you know, gendered as a woman, um, that uh, they enter into the poems by virtue of experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and it, going back to that question that can poetry matter it's like whenever I hear that whenever it's released up in the air mm -hmm. it, it speaks of so much privilege of uh, as, as in terms of like who is this question being asked to and who is it leading out of the conversation and you know in terms of, of both your works I mean the the politics uh, we it's difficult to sort of identify what you know if, if the political moment or the poetic moment comes first it, it's almost like they come through simultaneous, right? There isn't one, that one is not a conscious decision. I think that's what we're hearing from both of you. They sort of come forth, you know, at the same time, simultaneously. That's, that's very, uh, very interesting to me. Um, and also in the, in the terms of, of form, and Claudia and Citizen, there's so many ways in which this defies easy categorization. There are ways in which the book, even the presentation of it, uh, completely reorients our 
view or a perspective in terms of what a poetry book looks like. And with Hua, you know, also the, the, the way they use white space in the line, in many ways I read it as these are, are pregnant pauses or these are erasures or these are uh, standing in for words or for things that we are losing or have been lost. So I want to ask you about form and how does that sort of enter into the process of your, of your writing? Uh, yeah, so I, thanks. I, um, I, I feel, uh, that I am, a, I kind of try to score, uh, in language, uh, the, and, and, and create the experience in the poem, right? So that, you know, that, the chestnut that, uh, poems aren't a description of an experience, but are an experience. And I think by including, uh, the pause or the break or the fragment is part of um, uh, trying to reach that experience of the fragmentation or the simultaneity or uh, the collage sort of um, sense of, of beingness. And, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I'm thinking about when you ask that question. Um, I was thinking two things. One, in terms of the this poetry matter, as you were talking, it made me think of Lewis Hyde's The Gift. Yes. So that the whole discussion around mattering really is about capitalism and um, what makes money and what's wonderful that's about like value. Exactly, and what creates value is is um, what creates cash. And um, what's fantastic about poetry is that it doesn't matter in that way. <laughs> and, and, and yet it matters. And so it's really, um, it's so, sub I mean, we're subversive, that's cool. We're, you know, we, by virtue of the fact that we took on something outside of the system, we took on, you know, we, do we, we decided to engage outside of the system. And, and what's interesting to me is that um, in in North America, um, poetry is pretty much ignored by the bigger culture, right? The dominant culture. But in other countries, like in Vietnam, you if you're not a state, like a card carrying state stamp approval poet, you you will be arrested for organizing a poetry reading series. And you can't print, like what I was doing with Skanky Possum, I, could, I, I wouldn't be able to make a magazine uh, or a book uh, for someone else. Um, because they understand, like, poetry is actually really fucking powerful. And so you only want the state stamp approval poets because it's subversive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I think the, the mechanism that North America uses of just ignoring it is actually really effective. Because <laughs> I kind of wish I get, would get shut down. Mm -hmm. I get a ticket for writing poetry. <laughs> Take it away. I don't know. Um, and in terms of form, I, it's funny that you bring up Olson because I, I, I think I agree with him that form and content are, you know, are, are, are sort of married and um, so I, I never really think about the form until I'm inside the subject. And when the subject demands something, you know, for instance, in Citizen, there's an essay on Serena Williams. And um, it, it felt wrong to, to try and make it into um, a, a, prose poems when what I was trying to communicate was an argument around a continuous bombardment of injustice on the court for her. And so it just seemed like the essay was the right thing for that. And so I, I don't, I, and what's fantastic about poetry is its mutability and the fact that you can make the book do what you want the book to do. So I, you make Citizen, it has variable forms in it, but then you go back to somebody like 
like Robert Lowell and you look at life studies and it's actually not that different from life studies. Um, you know, so it's, 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 we're here probably because it gives us room to move. And also, uh, you know, going back to the, to the issue of the, I think I going back to the issue of, uh, of um, the, the role of poetry in this country, the other thing I, you know, when I hear this, uh, sort of the dismissiveness or the dismissing of the power or the politics of poetry or even the dismissing of political, what people call political poetry. And then you bring up this issue of a war in other countries or outside the U.S. I mean, this is also in the Americas. I mean, how many people are imprisoned or executed or, or shunned or, or silenced because of, of what goes into, into, the, into the poem. The poem as a powerful tool of communication. And I think that in this country, it is changing. I think it's, it's been here too. It's just like who has been listening to those communities that have been using poetry as not only an avenue for expression, but as an avenue for uh, expressing discontent, expressing uh, a perspective on, on some serious issues. I mean, certainly for the, the Chicano community, poetry was above any other form, even above uh, uh, art or theater or any or, or any other manifesto. It was the most urgent way of sharing and communicating uh, in emotion and expression and, re and reaction to what was happening to this community in the 1960s. So, and I think that books like yours, both of yours, are sort of helping in that, ushering in this idea that poetry has always been important in this country, and no matter, and you have to question who steps forward and says that it doesn't. And, and by asking that question again, does poetry matter? Can poetry matter? Can poetry change anything? Can it change the world? It's like, well, you know, again, who is asking that question? Why is it being asked? That's where the question, that's where our attention should be. And also, who are you listening to? Because there are plenty of people in the, within the borders of this country that are using it, using it in very positive ways. And I definitely, listening to, to both of your readings today, I definitely see that. I want to ask um, a very specific question to each of you. Uh, Claudia, you know, you're part of this incredible uh, movement in this country, the African American community, and, and, and the way poetry has been really been an important leader, I think, for many other communities in terms of how Comic Con and other organizations have really shaped uh, a voice of, of, made up of many voices. And so my question was, and what do you see moving forward as the next stage? What What is this community going to be addressing, possibly, that has not been addressed? or that needs to be addressed more? Hmm. Ah, that's a... That's a big question. I, I, <laughs> I think that's a question for you and the tarot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Kabe Kanem did uh, an incredible thing by bringing together African-American writers in the same room and collecting everyone from, you know, all these communities across the country. And it seems sort of a no-brainer, but it was odd that it all of a sudden, you know, somebody said, let's do this, and then it was done. And it now it's... For me, it's, you know, because it's all about me, right? Um, for me, it's a great thing because I, it doesn't matter where I go in the country now. Um, in the room are, are African-American writers who, who come to the readings. And it makes a difference to feel like, I don't know who you people are, maybe, but I know who those people are, certainly. And you feel collected, and which I feel um, this organization is also doing. Um, so, so what is the next step? I don't know. I don't know what the next step is. Um, maybe the next step. There's a there's a critic, Robin Kelly. Um, he teaches in uh, Los Angeles, and he wrote this um, this critical theory book. But the last chapter of, of one of his books talks about surreal, the surreal, and that the way change happens is that somehow you have to jump out 
of the continuum and make a leap into something that is not imagined or not yet imagined. And so, so I, I can say that I don't know what the next step is, but it will probably be one of those steps that isn't sort of the next step, it's some other kind of jump. It's a, you know, it's a jump out. You know, I had a question for you in terms of, um, in terms of your many homes, uh, you, your, your movements from your homeland to your time in the States to your time in Canada. And I was curious about how that, how that, if, if that even played, if that played a role in your development as a writer, where you set your sights next, how it has shaped your vision as a writer, and maybe you can speak uh, of it through maybe the immigrant lens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Like I'm I'm from a lot of different places, uh, and so it, there is this. I think there is a kind of theming around the diasporic experience or the experience of exile, or the experience of being the outside of the outside of the outside, which I think is where artists generally inhabit that space, um, traditionally. And um, so yeah, so it's just, it's, it's, been, it's been interesting to, to have this new nest um, in this other space where I'm othered in different ways. <laughs> I'm an American, which is weird to feel American also it's weird uh, in Canada um, it's a, it's a different it's it's so that it, and it's an opportunity too to um, to unpack what what is that what is what is what does that mean to be an American um, living outside of the US um, it's, it so it is a complication and it, and it's a kind of gift too because it gives us new perspective and way of seeing um, that I appreciate. Um, but I, I also wanted to say something about your earlier question that I didn't get to, and I was actually thinking of Claudia's work um, and your relationship to the sentence, and how I really have a very strange relationship to the sentence. Like, I want to mess it up. Like, I'm always wanting to mess it up, because I think I deeply distrust the sentence in a certain way. And I was wondering what your relationship, if you don't mind if I redirect the conversation, um, to, to the sentence. And because I, so someone asked me this the other day about relationship to sentences. And I, and I said, it reminded me of the Blondie song. And I, for the longest time, I thought she was singing, she's so tall, but it, she's actually singing, she's so dull. But the lyric is, I thought was tall. She's so tall, come on, rip her to shreds. And I just like, I think that's my relationship with the sentence. Like, I just want to rip it to shreds. It's just, like too tall. Like, you know, it's like, it's, like I want to mess with it. And, um, and like, it's sense making, right? And uh, so I was wondering what you're, if you have a kind of dissonant relationship with this material that we work with, which is language, which is so, like, also packed with. Uh, difficulties. I, I think I have the opposite relationship yeah. to the sentence in the sense that um, I I love revising poems, you know, like that. That is my thing that I love to do. <laughs> in the sense that I love sitting at the computer and working on a sentence until it gets to a place where I feel like it's transparent. In so that it it so that you can move through it, and it drops down and does certain things, and yet it doesn't hold you. It doesn't, you know, hinder you in your movement. And um, so I feel like all of the years of revising has to do with getting the sentence to be clear, in the sense of that 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 way in which as you're reading it you simultaneously get it and never get it. You know? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't um, trip you up in any way, and yet it drops down like a scent. And so I, I, I just, I love that kind of moving things around and working it until, until it doesn't, until it doesn't hold me. 
So I, I actually love the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely it comes through in, in both your approaches, and yet it seemed like you were both sort of also heading the same direction, even though the, the journeys there were, were quite, quite disparate. But I want to give an opportunity to maybe one or two people in the audience to ask a question of our, of our readers back there. I can't. Somebody raise your hand. Yes? Um, this question is for Claudia. I, um, I was noticing in Citizen that sports comes up a lot. And um, I, um, I was recently at a reading, and the organizers of the reading, um, one of them was sort of looking for things to worry about. And uh, the reading was the same night as the World Series. And she was like, I don't know if people are going to come because it's the same night as the mm-hmm. World Series. And uh, somebody else said, uh, no, 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 these are, these, are, these are book people. They're not sports people. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just noticed that sports was, was something that uh, with tennis, and you talked about the essay on Serena Williams, and there's the soccer uh, mentioned. So I was interested in your relationship to sports and what you think about that as, as, a, as a sort of um, cultural artifact, I guess, sort of, um, and why that might be interesting for a poet to explore? I, yeah, I, um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a full disclosure right now. You ever watch that Sex in the City um, <laughs> show where Samantha has to watch baseball games in order to, <laughs> well, in a way, that's how it started. <laughs> you know, that you know, my my husband was interested in golf, so I would watch golf. And was I interested in golf? No, I was not. <laughs> but as I would watch it, I became interested in Tiger Woods, and I became interested in the commentators. Um, interaction and read on on his every move, and. Um, and then I became interested in the Williams sisters. And because I was interested in the Williams sisters, I became a huge tennis fan. To the point where now I play tennis. Um, so I could understand what was going on, really, in my, you know, in terms of... Um, so, but I think sports, there's, um, there's a, a visual artist named Paul Pfeiffer. I don't know if anyone knows his work. But one of the things that um, he does, he has this fantastic video where he isolates a basketball player um, in an arena and there are lights going off everywhere and the guy has made a shot or done something good. Whatever he did, it was good. And he goes, he does that gesture where he goes, and Pfeiffer has it happen and he, again and again and again and again and again and again. And the repetition, which is very lyrical and poetic, ends up turning this triumphant moment into the action of a caged animal. And you begin to see the arena as, as this thing that's, that's locking him in. And so... The idea that sports and, you know, and then I've, I've read a lot of um, work that talks about, like, white men and their fascination with black athletes and what that is. And so as a place where um, race is on display, literally on display and um, in play, it's it's... It has it has taken over my attention. You know what what is that line from? Um, you know when he goes, "Gentlemen, you now have my attention." That what was that from? Um, Django Unchained. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's 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 you know just recently, and and then I'll stop. But just see now, see this is a problem with me in sports. <laughs> Just recently, I, the um, the end of the year championships happened for the women's tennis, and um, they were in Singapore, and and 
the week before they happened, the Russian um, guy in head of, at the head of the Olympic team called the Williams sisters the William brothers. And then Serena was responding to that like the day before she went to Singapore. So then she plays her first match and she loses. And the and Mary Carrillo, one of the commentators, says, "You know, you all, you're always talking about what a great player she is, but that's her problem. Just because something happened in the world, who cares? She's supposed to show up here and play her best tennis. But look at her; she's an emotional wreck." <laughs> And this is, they're saying this as I'm, you know, you're watching it, and this woman is going on about this. So, okay, that's it. <laughs> Are you interested in sports, Juan? Are you a sports person? Not really. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in the lens that, that Claudia is talking about, though. But yeah, I loved your book. Thanks. <laughs> is there another question there? Yes, right here. Um, this is in regard to something you said, Claudia, but I think maybe hopefully you can both speak to it. You said that citizen is a response to intimacy and what happens when that intimacy is broken. And so as a black person, I, I feel like with other black people, that intimacy is implied everywhere else. I have to earn it. And so like, I see that the intimacy has been broken, but I can't for the life of me remember or figure out what it looked like before it was broken. So what, what is this, paint me that picture, like, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what it looks like, and this is where I think we meet, our books meet, um, it looks ordinary. It looks domestic, it looks, um, you know, because ultimately we are the same. We wake up, we brush our teeth, we eat breakfast, that we get pissed off at our partners, you know, we meet our friends, et cetera, et cetera. So, but then that's why it's not about um, scandal or large things. It's about everybody having these very mundane, ordinary days. And then all of a sudden, some racial, imaginary, racist construction comes out and you just are, you know, you are thrown in to something that was constructed externally to you. So some, you know, some mode of aggression is thrown at you because somebody else needs to stand in a certain way for themselves at that moment. And, and then the day changes. You know, I, I was saying this yesterday. I arrived here from L.A. Um, at JFK, and as I was getting off the plane, this white man said to me, thank you. And, <laughs> and I said, you're welcome. <laughs> and then he was walking, and, and I was walking, and he turned back to me and he said, oh, I thought you were wearing a uniform. I was wearing red tights and a little black dress. And um, I said, not today. And, and he said, but you do work for the airlines. And I said, no, I don't work for the airlines. But it was that thing like, I made a mistake, but I was right, wasn't I? You are, you are here to serve me, aren't you? Aren't you? I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not here to serve you. But that, you know, but up until that moment, my day was just going along. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I like that you said that part about um, that it's ordinary, right? It's this dailiness that it's not about like profound thoughts, particularly, or this thing addressing like a, some sort of global body. Uh, po that's the how is that even possible? Uh, right. So to 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 try to arrange it through the daily uh, feels uh, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I love about your work is that 
it has this dailiness, but then all of the political um, ramifications that actually create the dailiness, control the dailiness, come up through the poem, so that we understand the political and social constructs that that put in place what we then hold as ordinary. Maybe one one last question before we make time. Yes, back there. So I have a question. I mean, I've actually read the interview you had with Laura Vermont, and I'm asking a slightly redundant question that you answered there, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the images that you chose and their relationship to the text in the book. And I know there you mentioned that you preferred, for example, the images to be in a blank page. Um, and I was kind of interested in that because I was just thinking through the representation of the images, um, and your, if you could just talk a little bit about that. The, um, so in the book, the images are people like Glenn Langon, Carrie Mae Weems, um, Nick Cave, uh, uh, David Hammonds. So people who are, whose work are engaged in, in my subject, in the subject of the ways in which um, this racial imaginary is polluting one's ability to move through a space, a life, but doing it differently. And what I liked about the images were that they, they held the subject a different way. And so um, the reader would engage with the image in ways that I didn't know. And I liked the mystery of that. I liked, instead of the silence, I liked this idea that one would turn away, but turn away into another thing that would push back the subject at them. Because one of the things I wanted with the book was that it would mimic the way in which these aggressions, these moment of aggressions accumulate in the body. And I wanted the reader to be trapped inside. And so to move away was to move away a different way into the same thing. Um, so, yeah. Well, since we are book people, as somebody already said, and we are surrounded by books, I wanted to end me by asking you to each recommend one book that you are excited about today to our audience. To recommend one book to all of us. Well, uh, uh, this is going to sound kind of strange, but um, dicte. It, uh, you know, because of your question about the image, one of the things I loved about dicte is that the way in which the image in, in, in that book refuses to be read sometimes. And so they feel aggressive in their, in their sort of misinterpretation of things. Um, so dictate, but also if, if we don't use that and use something else. I just <laughs> I just read Open City by Teje Cole, which I which I found very interesting. I'm gonna lay out and say you should read Claudia's book, Citizen. This is it, but literally I'm super excited about it and I just really I really, really love it. That's all. Well, okay. I'll say, oh, well, thank you very much, everybody. One round of last round of applause for our wonderful readers. And I believe we have folks for sale in the back. You see, some gonna hate, some gonna relate. I'm only trying to find my way, find my way. Some gonna relate, maybe one day we'll find our way. And friends stand three days later with his mother, just returned from Somalia, his father still dying, unable to fly. <laughs>